Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Analysis and Design of a DCM Flyback Converter. What is a flyback converter? Here is a basic configuration. We have a coupled inductor that looks like a transformer, but it's really an inductor because it's storing energy. There is a switch. When the switch is on, energy is pumped into the core while this diode is in the off state, while when the switch is open, that is non-conducting, then current will flow through the diode to the output. So the nice thing about the flyback is there's no need for a filter inductor at the output, a very simple topology, and this is why the flyback is so popular in many, many applications. Now, what is DCM or discontinuous mode flyback converter? In this case, the operation is the same. Switch is on. I'm showing here the inductance of this core, L sub M. This, the current is flowing through the inductor, storing energy in this inductor. At this state, the voltage across the diode is in the opposite polarity because of the dot here and the dot here, and consequently, the diode will not conduct. As the switch is turned off, I'm showing now the inductance at the secondary. It's easier to explain it this way. And this inductance now, which had energy stored in it, will move this energy or the current to the load. So this is the operation of the flyback, the basic flyback. Now the difference between a continuous a CCM, continuous current mode, and a DCM, this is a discontinuous current mode, is that the current of the energy storing inductor is going up and then at the secondary it'll go down to zero and there will be a period here when there is no current in this there is no current in this inductor either in the primary or the secondary hence the name discontinuous actually current mode flyback converter now the nice thing about this uh, DCM operation is that you start with a zero current at the primary, so this is actually zero current switching at the primary because there is no current in this inductor as you turn the switch on. And also, as the current goes down to zero at the secondary and it's disconnected here, then you have a zero current switching of the diode at turn off when it's going from the on state to the off state. So this is nice, it's reducing losses. However, there is a turn off loss of the switch because as this switch is turned off, this is the control of the switch, voltage will rise and then of course you might have some switching losses here at the turn off instant. So the advantages of the flyback converter by itself are that it is an economical topology, it's isolated, so it's very good for offline application like a, like a cell phone charger. It can be built into multiple output, none of them would require a filter inductance. In DCM we have zero current switching and turn on, zero current switching turn off the, the rectifier diode. And as I'll show later, we can achieve partial or full zero voltage switching with additional circuitry. And finally, the DCM configuration is easier to stabilize because of the open loop transfer function, the small signal open loop transfer function is really well behaved. It's at 20 dB per decade drop, so it's easy to stabilize. Now the downside of the flyback and DCM is especially the DCM, it has a higher conduction losses because of the peak current. Uh, therefore, you would need a larger core. And so therefore, it is really suitable for low power, probably up to 100 or maybe 70 watts uh, in, from the practical point of view. So first of all, let's have a look at the voltage transfer ratio of the flyback DCM converter, that is the V out over V in transfer function. This is the one large signal transfer function. The simplest way to derive this relationship is to apply the fact that this topology is really pumping energy from input to output. 
so that I can calculate what is the amount of energy which is stored into the inductor and then delivered to the output and from that I can find out what would be the output voltage given a load resistance R. So let's start off with the energy stored in LM when the switch is on. As we have a T on timing, current goes up to a peak and therefore the power stored in LM will be this peak value square LM over 2 FS and we have an expression here for the I peak T on times V in over LM so therefore this is the power pumped in and the power coming out and I'm assuming of course here a 100% efficiency it will be V out square over R so from power coming in power going out I can get the ratio between V in and V out which is this relationship. It's interesting to note that this relationship really does not include N, that is the number of turns of this couple inductor element. And the reason is, as I have said before, that really doesn't matter what is the uh, turns ratio, you have an energy coming in and it'll be the same energy coming out, assuming 100% efficiency, independent of the uh, turns ratio. So this is the relationship between the output and input, and of course you can control it with the duty cycle as required for a converter, a DC-DC converter. How do we approach the design of this unit? Usually we'll be given the input voltage, the output voltage that we have to stabilize. We have chosen the switching frequency and the maximum output power that we need. And also we have to specify what is the maximum voltage across the switch that we would tolerate. As the switch is turned off, we are going to have a voltage which is first of all the input voltage plus the voltage re reflected from the output to the input. So the total voltage will be V in plus V out over N. 1 to N is the ratio here. Of course, N could be smaller or larger than 1. So this is the stress on the transistor. It will be usually a MOSFET uh, during off state. So this is the information we have to start off or later on we can actually by iteration uh, choose it, taking into account the other parameters. And what we have to find is the LM T on and N. So start with T on. It is clear that the longer the T on for a given power, then the RMS value of the inductor current at the input, that therefore the current, the RMS current of the switch will be smaller. That is, if T on is longer, obviously you would need to go to a lower peak value for the same amount of power because you have a longer timing here for the pulse. So therefore you'd like to have T on as large as possible. On the other hand, as we will see in a minute, T off will affect the voltage which is reflected back to the transistor, to the switch in the off position. The shorter the T off the higher will be the voltage. So you'd like to have T off also very long. So you have two opposing uh, requirements here and obviously there is a process in each design, there are many degrees of freedom and you'll have to decide uh, what is more important uh, in your particular application. So one way to start is to say okay uh, let's have it halfway, uh, T on is half the period and T off is also half of the period for the maximum uh, power level. So we start off with expressing the power as I peak square LM over 2 and we have an expression for I peak V in T on over LM and then we can express the I peak as the square of 2 P over LM. Here already we can see that the smaller the LM the larger will be the I peak makes sense. If LM, LM is small then the rate of rise of the current will be high and you'll have an I peak. So here we have a situation that LM, a small LM, will bring up a high I peak. 
and then we can plug in instead of the current this value and we see here that there is a relationship between T on and LM that is the longer T on the larger LM and therefore the smaller will be I peak that, that's what we have said before so we have here uh, a trade-off between these two and then we see that the I peak at the secondary which is the I peak at the primary over N is related to the output voltage times T of over LM so when T off is longer for the same peak current N will be larger and therefore VDS maximum will be smaller so you like T off to be larger and finally we have here the requirement of course that the duty cycle uh, T off over T which is the off time will be smaller or equal to 1 minus T on over T that is the total is the duration of the period of the uh, switching frequency so here we have a number of constraints and like any other design problem there is a need to decide what is more important uh, what I would do is to really start with T on T off to be equal work out this relationship and see if you are satisfied with the output voltage reflected to the transistor when it is in the off state and if you are okay with the peak value which is of course affecting the RMS and if not then you can iterate by increasing T on or decreasing T on and getting a value which is more suitable for your application. Next I'm going to talk about protection of the transistor against spikes. In the situation that we have as the transistor is turned off we are with a current of I peak through the primary and the leakage inductor that we will always have between the primary and secondary so you have a current flowing here the I peak value and now you turn off the transistor so you have now sort of a resonant circuit like here this is the reflected voltage from the secondary this is the leakage inductance initial condition is this I peak value and this is the output capacitance of the transistor and obviously you're going to have uh, a oscillation like this and this could be fairly high and this could damage the transistor in the off position so you have to do something to protect the transistor and what you really need is a clamp that is something to limit the maximum value across the transistor now you can think about a number of ways to do it for example you can put a zener diode here that will clamp it you can put replace the zener with an RC circuit so that the current flowing here builds up a voltage and this is sort of like operating like the zener now obviously the voltage here must be larger than the V in plus the reflected voltage because you want only this portion of this energy to go into this um, clamp and not clamp the primary when the secondary is conducting so that when the secondary is conducting you have to leave this primary free from loading and therefore this voltage here here must be larger than these two that is the reflected plus V in so we can have a clamp like this or we can have a clamp like this now the advantage of this one is that the voltage across this resistor is smaller than the voltage across this resistor because across this resistor we're going to have V in plus the reflected voltage and we want it to be higher than that while here we just need to be higher than the reflected voltage so obviously the dissipation of this resistor for the same amount of current flowing uh, will be smaller than this so this is the way to go however we have to remember in a real circuit there are many inductances strain inductances the wiring between the wiring etc and consequently if you clamp this drain to this point you're actually protecting the coupled inductor 
and not a transistor, because here we still have inductors that the current will be interrupted and there will be a high voltage here. So in order to remedy this, you have to be very careful in the layout and putting uh, decoupling capacitors. And for example, I'm showing here that this is now the clamp. And then we have here an extra capacitor, which is locking the current in here and the clamping the voltage so that when you have here uh, changes, this will actually attenuate them and protect the transistor. So the question now is, how do we design the clamp? Now let me just mention that I'm talking about a passive clamp. There is also an active clamp, which I'm not covering here, which has a capacitor the same way, except that the energy of this capacitor is recycled. That is, the energy is not lost to heat uh, with the resistor as we have it here. And this active clamp is not covered in this presentation. So we are talking about a passive clamp, and the question is, how do we choose the resistor and capacitor? Now the constraints are that I need to develop a voltage here, which is higher than the reflected output voltage. Okay, this voltage, here it is. This is like a circuit, equivalent circuit of what is really happening here or here. We see this is the reflected voltage. This is the liquid. There is the initial condition, the peak current. And this is the clamp, RC and C. Obviously, I'm going to have some ripple. And I can already understand that the time constant of C times R has to be longer than the switching so that the ripple will be acceptable. So how much lo larger, let's say five times, will be okay. So we'll have a small ripple here. So this is about the product of these two. Now what about the value? We can find the value by calculating the current, the average current that will be pumped in and this average current is, of course, passing through this resistor. This current times the resistance here is the desired voltage of the clamp, which should be larger than the reflected voltage. By the way, there is a common mistake assuming that the energy going to the resistor here is just the energy stored in the leakage, but this is incorrect because as you can see here, uh, we have actually energy coming from here too. So therefore, we have to calculate the actual average current coming here. Once we know this average current, we can multiply it by RC and get the desired value uh, of the voltage or the other way around since we know what is the voltage we want and if we know the current, then we can calculate the resistance. So how do we do that? We look at the shape of the current, it's going to be something like that. Uh, it's going to start with the I peak and then we'll drop a certain rate. And the rate is the difference between the voltage across the clamp, which I'm assuming to be about constant, minus the reflected voltage over the leakage inductance. Now you have to estimate the leakage inductor. You can measure it on, on your a coupled inductor element or estimate it uh, for studying this calculation. From this, we can calculate the time it'll take. Once we know the time it'll take, then of course we can find the average current. The average current is the peak times this time we found over 2 times the frequency, switching frequency. So we select what is the desired voltage of the clamp, we calculate the average voltage, we then can select RC, which is the desired value over this calculated volume, and then select the capacitor such that the time constant will be larger than the period of the switching frequency. Now, usually the estimates are not absolutely correct, so you have to sort of, uh, by trial and error a little bit, uh, trim it in the circuit to get uh, the right value of the resistor, but you have here a really good start for a good estimate of the initial value that you like to have. Let me talk a little bit now about switching losses of this uh, DCM flyback. As we already said, there are a couple of switching losses which need to be taken into account. 
Number one, we have the turn off of the transistor. As the transistor is uh, turned off, we have a swing of the voltage, there's a current, and therefore there's going to be some switching losses in this way. Now if we look now at the voltage across the transistor, we're going to see a jump to the voltage of the clamp, here it is, and then it'll sort of uh, stabilize to the V in plus the reflected voltage uh, from the secondary. Now, ideally, we'd like it to go down to zero, and then uh, we'll turn it on again. Unfortunately, that's not the case. As the current of the secondary is going down to zero, we will see here, and I'm going to see here, oscillations around the V in voltage, because there's no current here anymore, and so we are going to see some oscillation here. So here is the situation. We turn off the transistor, it jumps to the clamp voltage, then it goes to V in plus V out over N, and then as the inductor or the energy coming off the inductor is going to zero, then we're going to have these oscillations. Now the question is now, when are you going to turn on the transistor again? If you'll turn it on here, for example, the voltage across the transistor is high, and then you're going to have high losses due to the output capacitance of the transistor. However, if you turn it on here or here, then of course the losses will be much less. This is a method that is used by a number of controllers, commercial controllers that you can buy, that will actually look for the uh, valley here and will turn on the transistor at the valley. So this is sort of a poor man's zero voltage switching. It's not entirely zero voltage switching, but it's pretty close to it. As I have said, with a active clamp, you can get a much, much better zero voltage switching. You can get this to go almost to zero. And this, of course, will reduce switching losses uh, farther more. The final issue I'm going to cover in this presentation is the control, or more precisely, the open loop response the small signal open loop response of the DCM flyback converter. Now here's the actually end result. We have a breakpoint, a single pole at this point, and then we have a 20 dB per decade roll off, and then there is a zero here which flattens out. Well, this zero might be at high frequency, and of course this will be correct only for the portion of the frequency which is lower than the half of the switching frequency because otherwise we have sampling problems. So how do we get this response? We rely on the fact that this DCM flyback converter is in fact a current source at the output. We pump in energy at the input, there is an energy coming out at the output, and for a fixed or almost fixed voltage, then the current that we are pumping in is about fixed, a small signal current. So this is basically a current source. So we have a value of a current source, and then we have a transfer function or a breakpoint which depends on the impedance of this part here. This is the load resistance and the capacitor with its uh, ESR. For the low frequency portion of this curve, I start off with this expression that we have found before. Now, taking the derivative of this expression, V out and D, I'm getting this ratio of small V out over small D as this expression here, V in times this square root of these elements. So this is this portion here. Now, as we can see, the height here is a function of R. That is, the larger the uh, load resistance, uh, the larger, the higher will be uh, this portion of the curve. Now, the breakpoints are a function of this impedance. And this impedance can be found as uh, these two branches in parallel, and which comes out to be this. And then we find that we have a pole and a zero in these uh, places. So therefore we have a pole here and I have a zero here. And again, this will be correct for frequencies which are smaller than half of the switch.
switching frequency. So we can see that this is a really nice uh, transfer function, very easy to compensate by a uh, type 2 or a PI controller and uh, one has however to take into account that the, this whole curve shifts up or down depending on the value of R of the load so you have to make sure that the, your controller will be providing a stable point for the family of curves which are a function of the load. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it interesting and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.